Hmm. Namaste, everyone. Christian Long, Life Enhancement Consulting. Give you a big and beautiful shout out on this Transformation Q&A Thursday, number 15. And before we begin, let us invoke. Be, place your hands on your heart and be aware of your heart. Bring your awareness to the heart. Allow the heart to expand. Remember, we're focusing on the energetic heart, not the physical heart which expands past the chest, past the shoulders, and beyond. Be aware of the crown. Be aware of the expansion of the crown. Be aware of the heart and the crown together. To the Supreme God, Divine Father, Divine Mother, Respect and beloved teacher, Grandmaster Cho Fuksui, Lord Mahaguru Jaminling, to Lord Buddha Kuan Yin, to Lord Ganesh, to Sarasvati, to Holy Master Count Saint Germain, to all the holy gurus, holy masters, saints, archangels, holy angels, healing angels, healing ministers, to our divine selves or higher souls, we humbly invoke for your divine light, love, and power, for your divine help, guidance, and protection. We ask for greater awareness, understanding, and inner transformation. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you with tremendous gratitude, respect, and love. We thank you in full faith. So be it, so be it, and so it is. Thank you. Had an itch. Welcome, welcome, <laughs> welcome, everyone. It's good to have you guys on. And uh, for, for those people watching the replay, welcome to the replay. Um, so let's... Uh, there is something I want to cover. This keeps coming into my awareness. And so um, I think it'll be helpful for everyone that's part of the inner transformation membership, especially the, the Q and A's that we do on Thursday. So everything begins with awareness, right? I built my entire healing practice on the quote by Grandmaster Cho Kokusui that says, without awareness, there's no inner transformation. So the analogy I've used in the past is, is the example of someone who has a drinking problem and they're not aware of their drinking problem. And it's only when they've lost their job, they've lost their family, they destroyed their car, they got kicked out of their house, and they're practically living on the streets. That is when they get court ordered by a judge to attend a 12-step program. And the first day of the 12-step program, the person stands up and says, hi, my name is John and I'm a alcoholic. That's the moment of awareness. Now, did John have many, 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 many opportunities to have awareness around his drinking problem three years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, 20 years ago? Because in general, people don't just start drinking heavily and ruining their lives the next day, right? There's a, there's a, there's a gradual process of destruction. So when John is sitting up at the AA meeting and says, my name is John and I'm an alcoholic. He is practicing awareness in that moment that there's a problem. Wasn't aware of the problem when it was destroying the relationship with his family. Wasn't aware of the problem when it was destroying the relationship at his workplace. Wasn't aware of the problem of him being unable to pay his bills. Wasn't aware of the problem of passing out on the front lawn during the week, right? I actually had an uncle who was a functioning alcoholic for IBM for 30 plus years, high paid executive for IBM. And he would go in, he's left the body. So this isn't uh, you know, damaging the family because it is what it is. And he would come home after work, right? A functioning alcoholic means you show up and work on time, you do your job properly, you get your promotions properly, you go home and then your life falls apart after you get off of work. So he would literally get off of work, start drinking in the parking lot, and then drive home completely drunk, and then park the car in the most uh, maybe not aligned ways, i.e. the lawn, and then he would get out of the car and he would pass out on the lawn. And my aunt at the time had to go out and, and take care of him, bring him in. And it was just something that was accepted at that time. This is in the 60s and 70s. It was just accepted. It was just, that's Frank. That's just how he is, right? Never mind the opportunity of potentially killing people and, 
you know, running them over, running over kids, running over dogs, like, you know, causing mayhem. So if you were to say, hey, Frank, do you have a drinking problem? What is he going to say? Of course not. I just occasionally drink. Not a problem. I got it under control, right? So there's no awareness. There's self-delusion. There's lack of honesty to oneself. So these programs and patterns get instilled in the person's consciousness and it prevents someone from seeing what is obvious, right? Grandmaster Cho Fuksui says, what is enlightenment? Noticing what is obvious. So a person who is clouded by negative programs and limiting beliefs, calcified ideas cannot see what is obvious. They are not aware. The way we have awareness is by being still, letting, how do I put this? So when you're physically still, your emotional body becomes stimulated. When you become aware of your emotions, they begin to calm down or slow down would be another way of looking at it. And then your mind becomes more active and stimulated. And then when you become aware of your thoughts, your thoughts begin to become more still. And then you can become aware of the higher soul, the energies of the soul, right? So most people don't practice physical stillness which doesn't allow them to have emotional stillness, which doesn't allow them to have mental stillness, which doesn't allow them to be guided by the will and intelligence and love of the higher soul, right? So when we invoke and we say, thank you for blessing us with awareness, without awareness, there's no inner transformation. So you go from awareness to having understanding. So you're aware, okay, I'm aware of my physical body. What is my physical body telling me? Huh, my heart feels really tight. Why does my heart feel tight? Why does my chest feel tight? What's going on? Huh, as I practice stillness in my physical body, I'm, I'm aware of um, this tightness in my solar plexus, this heat in my solar plexus. Huh, I wonder what that is. So with awareness, you start practicing understanding. You start questioning the lower level of truth. What's happening with my physical body? As you practice stillness in your emotions, you start going, huh, okay, I'm aware that my emotions are irritated and erratic right now. Huh, why is that? When you ask why, Asana Chakra becomes engaged, which is connected to the higher soul, and you start seeking to understand. You start seeking to understand. And then when you have understanding, you can start practicing with the new understanding and have inner transformation. The reason people don't transform is because they lack awareness. So they have very little understanding or none at all. They don't know what to practice. And then they therefore can't, can't um, how do I put this? They can't transform their inner self. That's why I was talking with a client earlier today about this, is that when you go to therapy, your therapist is bringing up the past or bringing up the situation to give you what? Awareness, right? You have to have awareness. Why am, why am I the way I am? Awareness. And then you start getting understanding around that awareness. Oh, well, the reason I feel, the reason I have low self-esteem, low self-worth, anger issues, and trauma is to the understanding of my childhood, is the understanding of the dynamic between my mother and father, my siblings, um, a, a relative, right? There are people that I know personally who have forgotten their entire childhood up to the age of 12, 13 years old. They literally don't remember what happened prior to that because there's so much trauma that their psyche has been protecting them from that they have no recollection whatsoever, right? So if you don't have awareness, you can't have understanding of your past, and then you can't take that understanding to transform yourself through a practice, So my experience has been people go through therapy, they get a little bit of understanding, right? They get some awareness, they get some understanding, but then there's no practice that they do on a regular basis. Some therapists give homework assignments. Some therapists do not give homework assignments. It is very important for somebody to have a homework assignment because you have awareness as to why you are the way you are, or you have awareness of what you are. Then you have awareness as to Uh, or understanding as to why you are the way you are, then you have to practice with that new awareness and understanding to transform yourself. 
So if you realize you have anger issues, you realize where they're coming from and that you have to practice forgiveness to let go and to heal and to move forward, but you're not practicing forgiveness, there's no inner transformation. So that's why people can be in therapy for five, seven, 10 years or more. I know many, many people who have made marginal progress after being in therapy for many, many, many years because there's no practicing in that. So that's why this group is very, very pragmatic in its approach. We could be more pragmatic for sure. And I might over time think of ways to help you guys practice more of what we are sharing in each of the lessons. Okay. So awareness leads to understanding, leads to a practice and then leads to inner transformation, right? Because if you're, if you've been quote unquote meditating for 10, 15, 20 years, and you still have anger issues, guess what? You lack awareness in that part of your life. Someone who's been on the spiritual path for 10, 15, 20 years should have no anger issues. If they're practicing correctly, and what does correctly mean? With awareness, right? One of the uh, common one of the common traits of people that are on the spiritual path is because they study a lot, they learn a lot, right? They have a lot of inner experiences and that makes them what? Prideful, meaning I'm superior to other people because I have a spiritual practice or I'm superior to another person because I'm a vegan versus just a vegetarian or I'm superior to another person because I exercise daily and other people don't exercise at all, right? That's coming from low self-esteem. So, you have, to, you have to ask yourself the question, I've been practicing this for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. This path has my life transformed. Am I better now than I was a year ago, five years ago, 20 years ago? Or am I about the same? I, I had anger issues 20 years ago. I have anger issues now. Is your system working? Is your practice working? Right? If not, you need to change something. But it goes back to awareness. So that's why when we invoke, we ask for awareness. We ask for temporarily our consciousness to expand more. So when the information is being shared, people are open and receptive to receiving it, becoming aware of it, understanding it, practicing that, that understanding, and then transforming from within. Okay. So one question, I almost didn't pop open the window. So one question is from a very special, very small person in the group. We love her so much. She's actually in the room right now. <clears throat> West Sac celebration details, like the location. Okay, the location is within. Just kidding. Okay, so the location is <clears throat> because we support the West Coast, because this, in, this instructor is here pushed in the, the West Coast. I have to support the West Coast, right? If you own a McDonald's, you don't shop at Wendy's, right? So uh, if you go to chronichealing.com, there's going to be information about the West Sac Festival with all the details. But in general, it's going to be this coming Monday, April 26th at 941-ish p.m. Mountain Time 2021. So there is preparatory work, keyword being preparatory work, hours before the peak of the full moon of Taurus. So the peak is at 941-ish p.m. mountain time, but there's preparatory work where there's gonna be a lecture on the Four Noble Truths of Buddhism, the Eightfold Path of Buddhism. You're gonna be wearing all white. You're gonna be doing some physical exercises, some breathing exercises to prepare for the meditation. So we're all gonna be deep into the meditation at the peak of the full moon of Taurus also known as the Wesak Festival in the Buddhist tradition, okay? Um, correct. Don't worry, I'm getting to it. I see the question, I'm getting to it. Okay, so again, for people on the West Coast, or for because I support, I'm under the umbrella of the West Coast and Pranic Healing, you go to pranichealing.com and the information is there, and that's gonna be led by Master Co online. It's a free event. I think there's a love offering at the end or something like that. And then the other masters in pranic healing around the world are also going to be offering their own Wesak festival. Same Four Noble Truths, same Eightfold Path, same physical exercises, breathing, and meditation. It's just going to be with their energy and their style of teaching, right? So I hope that helps. So um, 
Again, this is the most powerful time of the entire year to meditate in a group. The most powerful time of the entire year. Meditating at the peak of the full moon of Wesak is equivalent to meditating every single day for, several, uh, for a couple months, for a couple months. So meaning when you sit and you do a meditation, twin hearts, for instance, you're generating a certain amount of energy of prana within your system. Your inner aura is going from two to four inches, right? Two to four inches to 35 to 50 feet one time. Now it doesn't stay that way for many factors, but in general, that's how much it expands in one meditation. During the WESAC, you're generating 60 twin hearts meditations in eight minutes. So a tremendous amount of energy. So I'd also recommend having your goals written out, things that you want to materialize, health goals, relationship goals, wealth goals, career goals, spiritual goals, character goals. And then at the end of every Wesak festival, no matter which master is leading it, there will be blessings to further concretize and materialize what it is that's important to you. Are there beings coming down apart from Buddha and Jesus Christ? Very good question. So the spiritual hierarchy comes down during the Wesak festival in etheric form. So you guys know that the physical body is the densest body that we have. The next body that's subtler is the etheric body, which is an exact blueprint of our physical body. So if you change your etheric body, it will in time change the physical body. The physical body has lag time. In the other bodies, the change is almost, not in all cases, almost instantaneous. So when you heal something in the mental body, the healing is permanent in the mind. But if you heal something etherically, it takes time for it to materialize physically. So if you get a cut on your hand, you're bleeding, you can do healing on the etheric body and within 30 seconds, the bleeding will stop. But the etheric body was affected almost instantaneously with the treatment right? So the great, great teachers once a year come down into the etheric plane. And this is a blessing or Shakti pot globally. So these great teachers are providing Mother Earth with certain blessings to elevate the consciousness of the planet and all sentient beings and all kingdoms connected to the planet. And this has been the longest ongoing meditation in human history, 2,500 years every single year for 2,500 years. So there's a lot of energy. So it's not just the presence of Lord Buddha. This is one of, um, as I understand it, one of the purposes that is still remaining in this teacher, one of the agreements that this teacher is doing for the planet Earth, coming back in etheric form once a year to bless the planet. I've had the opportunity of talking with one of my mentors, um, the first and I believe second Wesak festival I ever participated in and explained to me what he saw clairvoyantly. It was fascinating, but all the teachers are there. The spiritual hierarchy is there. It's like, um, it's like a uh, burning man, but for high level spiritual beings right so <clears throat> physically people gather to the west sac valley in between tibet and nepal so there's something called the west sac valley it's a physical location right and you can go there and meet physical yogis and if your clairvoyance is developed you can see the great great teachers materializing in the etheric plane and what they do during that moment of the eight minutes, the window is very teeny tiny. Eight minute window where all this downpour of energy. So remember the three most powerful full moons of the year, the full moon of, of Aries, which we just finished, which is cleansing the planet, preparing the planet. The full moon of Taurus, which is the West Act Festival is dropping a tremendous amount of divine energy into the planet at a certain locale, the West Act Valley, right? And then the full moon of Gemini 
is taking that divine energy and spreading it around the entire planet for healing. Okay, so all the great teachers are there. It's a big spiritual party of the hierarchy. Are the masters of the rays participating in their roles? Yes, right? We talked about the seven rays of creation. So certain teachers represent certain rays. So they are bringing down all the rays to have balanced development for humanity and or certain rays needed at certain times in a certain distribution, right? So maybe this year we need more ray two than say ray one or ray three, right? Making it simplified. Yes, other interdimensional inter beings, yes. What is the uniqueness of the event? What can it do for us and the earth? It helps the earth evolve. And we are part of mother earth. We are a cell, literally, we are a cell in mother earth. So as mother earth evolves, she takes us up with her. As she raises her vibration, we raise our vibration with mother earth. And as we meditate and purify and become greater instruments of goodwill and the will to do good, we also partially heal Mother Earth. So as within, so without, as above, so below. Ultimately, I know people have been preparing for it for weeks. How does the preparation affect the outcome? The cleaner and pure you are, meaning you've been watching your diet, maybe doing intermittent fasting, maybe doing fasting, uh, maybe cutting out meat, maybe cutting out smoking, drinking. The cleaner your physical vessel is, the more rapidly your bodies can assimilate the energy. If you've been working on practicing forgiveness and practicing gratitude and helping nourish and nurture your emotional body, your emotional body is going to absorb the divine energies faster. If you've been working on clarifying lying, self-delusion, self-conceitedness, negative pride, low self-esteem, things like that, that's also cleaning out your mental body. So as the divine energies come down through the Wessex Festival, you can absorb it super fast. So that's why the preparation is very, very important. And so different masters and senior practitioners within Phonic Healing have had preparatory practices for at least a week prior to WESAC. Also, it's recommended not to have sex. It's recommended not to release, to build and cultivate the energy and then, gen and then um, distribute it throughout your bodies. So it's a very cleansing healing time for spiritual practitioners around the world. Now, do you get the benefit of WESAC if you have no idea what the WESAC is? I learned about the WESAC 17 years ago. Wessack was happening before then, right? 2,500 years. So was I getting benefit prior to that? Yes, right? My soul was becoming illuminated because I'm connected with the soul of Mother Earth, right? But my purification practices were not in place and my conscious ability to harness and utilize the energies were not there. That's the benefit of knowing these techniques. So that's why, again, Wherever you are in the world, log into one of the Pranic Healing Masters and learn about the Four Noble Truths, learn about the Eightfold Path, and then do the meditation with the group. As you meditate with the group, the energy is exponentially more powerful, right? We talk about the number of seven. If you have seven people meditating at the same time, it's equivalent to 100 people meditating individually, the amount of energy that's generated, okay? Very good question. Um, and again, wear all white. Wear all white. Okay, next question. How do we handle loss in our lives? Ooh, levels of truth, right? How do we handle loss in our lives? If I told you that there is no such thing as loss and separation is an illusion, what would you say to me? Christian, you're crazy. You're heartless. My dog died last week. How can you say that? I miss my dog so much. What part of your dog is missing? Right? 
So it depends on the level of truth you're observing something from. So if your dog was once animated and is no longer animated, the soul of the dog has left, the collective soul would be more accurate, has left. But the, but the dog is not gone. The form has changed. The dog is not gone. The form has changed. So if you tell this to somebody who has just suffered tremendous loss in their viewpoint, they're going to resist. They're going to see you as cold, unkind, uncaring. So you don't share those with those things with people. My father passed away in the middle of the night. We had no um, warning ahead of time, right? His body got a cold. Two days later, he was upstairs and he had left the body around three o'clock in the morning. That next day, I got a message from both of my brothers on my phone. I had a client coming in. I heard the messages. Hey, dad, dad died. I'm like, and my client's coming to here in 15 minutes. And I did the healing and the person had a miraculous healing result, right? Does that mean I didn't love my father? No, not at all. I love my father very much. Does, does it mean I wasn't close with my father? No, I was close to my father. I talked to him every week, at least. What, what was it? Where was I operating from? My father is not the body. My father is the soul. My father's soul is now liberated because it's not in the body. And my father was physically and emotionally suffering at that time in his life. Suffering, lots of suffering is dissolved because he wasn't experiencing physical pain. And then we did the necessary healing technique to help his soul transition to the higher planes. So again, it's about proper understanding, right? With awareness. What's the awareness? Well, let's see. I have an awareness of sadness. I have awareness of grief. I have awareness of loss. Okay. What's the understanding behind that? Well, where am I feeling this? I'm feeling it in my emotional body. My emotional body is experiencing loss and grief. Okay. Well, what am I ultimately? I'm the soul. I'm a being of light, love, and power. Am I my feelings of loss and grief? No. Okay. So what can I do in this moment? Practice forgiveness, practice gratitude, practice contentment, and transmute the energies of loss and grief to those energies. And then healing has taken place. And then I energetically detach from the thing that is lost so it can go to the higher planes. You guys realize on the sides of the road and highways, when there's an accident, when there's a loss of life, and people create those little makeshift tombstones and they put the stake in the ground and they have the flowers and the pictures you know what they do they anchor the soul to that point they anchor the soul to that point so that soul has a harder time going up right for for it depends but in many cases months if not years the soul is anchored. It can't go to the higher planes because there's been a quote unquote Kriya Shakti of anchoring the soul to that point because of our inability to what? Let go. Our inability to realize separation is an illusion. There is no such thing as loss. A lot of the things that we are losing is our perception and our expectations. We expect things to never change. We expect our pets to always be there. We expect our loved ones to always be there. We expect fill in the blank. And then when those expectations are not met, we're disappointed, we're hurt, we have a sense of grief, we have a sense of loss, right? So that's not right viewpoint. Now, we have to meet people at where they're at, even yourself. So if you're experiencing the loss of someone, don't go, I am the soul. Forget all this stuff. The person meant nothing to me. No, there's a grieving process. The grieving process is deep within the emotional mental bodies. So you have to give it its due time. Just like your physical body when it's hurt, injured, cut, what have you, there's a process of healing. 
we can accelerate that process of healing through pranic healing protocols. Same with your emotional mental bodies. It takes time for it to heal. The more conductive, the more receptive a person is, the more ready, willing, and able they are to let go, then the healing is faster, right? But when Master Choa left the body, I, my emotional body and more was devastated. I cried way more when the teacher left the body than when my father left the body. Way, way, way more, right? My dad left the body in 2014. Master Cho left the body in 2007, seven years earlier. Devastated, right? Because the connection between a disciple and the guru is much stronger and much more intimate than the connection between you and your parents. That's if you're a disciple. If you're not a disciple, then the energy will be different, right? So when you realize the teacher is not the body, which is one of the higher teachings within pranic healing or hatha yoga in other schools as well, your spiritual teacher, your physical guru is not the teacher itself or himself or herself. It's not the body. The teacher is energy and the vehicle is the physical body the teacher is using to distribute that, right? If everyone was very developed, if everyone was a high level clairvoyant, if everyone could tap into subtle energies, there would be no need for physical teachers, right? But because we're still in the process of growing and evolving, we're still in the process of what? Developing awareness and understanding. We need a physical teacher. We need something to focus on. Aha, okay, he's a guy, he's this age, He's doing this with his hands. He's dressed like this. He's saying these things. He's telling me to do this, telling me not to do that. Okay, I can follow that. But on the higher plane, what's actually being taught? What's being shared? Energy, light. But we're, how many of us are there? I don't need a physical teacher. I just focus on the energy. That's why all the books within Pranic Healing are living, breathing energies. It's not just a stagnant page with print on it. It's living, breathing. It radiates light. If you look at it clairvoyantly, or you can scan it, it they radiate light because there's consciousness in the text. And that's the way it is with any great spiritual book from a spiritual teacher. Okay. So the first part of how do we handle loss, recognizing that there is no such thing as loss. Next part is giving yourself time for your mental body and emotional body to process. If you need to cry, cry. If you need to be sad, if you need to grieve, if you need to experience those emotional and mental experiences, go ahead. But in the background of your consciousness, I am that I am, I am that I am, I am that I am. This too shall pass. This is not who and what I am. And then you practice gratitude for that person and let them go, animals included. Let them go because your consciousness can anchor them and keep them from going higher. And then get healing. That would be the first thing I would recommend, get healing because it will speed up the process, the grieving process. It'll speed up the sense of loss. But again, Separation is illusion. We are all one. Spiritually, we are one. There is no separation. When you realize that the person is not the body, but the person is the soul, it changes your what? Viewpoint, which does what? Alleviate your suffering. And yeah, in the beginning, it might be the mental understanding. Okay, okay, I'm a soul. They're a soul. I'm not this body. They're not that body. Okay, okay. They're not alive anymore, but wait a minute. Are they really alive? But, okay. All right. So the soul is still there, but the body is not animated. Okay. So the soul left the body. Okay. Uh, I think I kind of get it. And as you continue to get it deeper and deeper and deeper, you will have that aha moment. Aha. I got it. They're really still here. They're around. We are one. Got it. So you're not coming from a fake it till you make it perspective. You're not coming from a lying to yourself. You just have to develop, develop uh, more awareness, more understanding. I like how Master Chol would teach things. And I noticed this with one of the other masters in chronic healing. If you don't get it, it's okay, 
right? The teacher's job is to pro provide the knowledge and the understanding of that knowledge. And then it's the, the student's responsibility to, to experiment with that knowledge. And if you don't understand it, that's okay. If you don't agree with it, that's okay, right? You meet people where they're at. Years ago, when I was sharing pranic healing or hatha yoga with people, I had this like intense desire to force upon them for them to see it like I saw it. I'm like, don't you understand how this can change your life? Don't you understand that this could solve a lot of the problems you're having right now with your relationships and the stress and your you know, dissatisfaction in your work? Don't you understand? Don't you get it? Don't you get it? Don't you get it? Right? But they just weren't open and receptive at that time. And that's okay. I didn't realize it then because I was overly ambitious and overly enthusiastic about pranic healing or hatha yoga. So I didn't give people space to grow, right? So you talk with people. If they're open and receptive to a new viewpoint, great. If they're not, that's okay. They're not there yet. No judgment, no criticism. You just move forward to another person who's receptive. Next question. Why are children afraid of the dark? Have you noticed this? Little tiny kids are afraid of the dark. Anyone curious? Why, why are children afraid of the dark? There are many factors, right? We can't cover them all. But simply put, when you go into the dark, the forehead, the boogeyman, ah, exactly. When you go into the dark, the forehead chakra becomes activated and the Ajna chakra becomes underactivated. What does the forehead chakra deal with everyone? Dun, 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 dun. Higher clairvoyance. The inner world. So number one, children they are more open and their webbing is thinner than adults so when the lights go out because children are more sensitive they have less filters they can see the inner world so they could be seeing angels devas they could also be seeing not so pleasant things elementals, entities, if the child lives in a very stressful environment, like there's a lot of trauma and drama at the homestead, what energies are going to be there? Those. So when the lights go out, the child can see those things. And this is with adults too, but we are less sensitive and we are, unless we're trained, our webbing is denser. So it's harder for us to perceive the inner world. I remember asking my son when he was about two and a half, I go, I go, Gabriel, do you see angels? And I showed him like pictures of beings of light. I said, Gabriel, do you see angels? He says, yes. And I said, what do they tell you? Seeing if this clear audience is getting developed, he says, that they love me. And I was like, sweet. All right, we got the outer world taken care of and we got the inner world taken care of, okay? So that's why children are afraid of the dark because the more sensitive kids, when the lights go out, the forehead chakra becomes activated and they start seeing the inner world and they don't know what it means, right? They're like, what is that? What is that? I know many adults, I actually know way too many adults that are afraid of the dark. I mean, like really afraid of the dark. So that's connected to a childhood trauma. Next question. If God is omnipotent, why doesn't he make us all enlightened now? Well, omnipotent means all powerful, right? Omnipotent means all powerful. The will aspect of God. Here's the thing. There are certain questions I can go into, and there's certain questions I can't really go into. The simple answer, which may not satisfy the person, is we have free will. Built into every sentient being, to varying degrees, is free will. From the human soul up. So animals 
don't have free will because their mental bodies are not developed enough. Plants don't have free will because they have no mental bodies. The min mineral kingdom has no free will because they have no mental body, they have no emotional body. They have only an etheric body. That's why if you want to program a crystal, it can't resist. If you want to tell a dog what to do, it can partially resist. If you want to tell a plant what to do, it's a little bit different dynamic, right? But crystals have no ability to resist will. They have no will of their own. So that's why you can tell them what to do, right? So if God is omnipotent, why doesn't he make us all enlightened now? Because that's not how creation works. You have free will, so you have the will to be in alignment with the divine plan for your life and the divine plan of the cosmos, 100%, or 95%, or 75%, or 1%, or 0. 0.000006%. So you have free will. You have free will to run out into the street and hurt somebody. You have free will to run out into the street and give somebody a hug. You have the free will to do that. Free will doesn't mean you are void of consequences. Every action has a consequence called law of karma. So if you hug somebody out of love and compassion, that's what comes back to you. If you run over somebody out of anger and aggression and ven revenge, that comes back to you. So we have the choice. We have the free will to become enlightened, to become holy or not. We can be the saint or the savage. But the interesting thing is because life is always moving towards evolution, Yes, you can be a savage, but lifetime after lifetime after lifetime of being a savage, one day your consciousness will wake up and become aware and go, huh, my life isn't going so well. Awareness. Then you start asking the questions, why is my life not going so well? Then you have a teacher, books, resources, right? to give you understanding, and then you start practicing some of that, and then you start transforming. So even the savage, after enough lifetime, will begin to wake up. Some wake up sooner than, late, than others. Next question, is there a mantra for attracting a soulmate? If I knew what it was, I would tell you all. A mantra that's very effective, for wish fulfillment, which is, this is connected to wish fulfillment, is Om Mani Padme Hum. The mantra of compassion and mercy. The mantra of compassion and mercy. So you can have your wish, the ideal partner, the ideal living situation, the ideal amount of money in your bank account, the ideal resolution of a health issue, right? Whatever the ideal situation you're seeking, and you can imagine it in front of you, and you can Bless it with the mantra, O Mani Padme Hum. And that floods and fills that with compassion, mercy, and wish fulfillment. Now, it is in the giving that we receive, right? So prior to asking for blessings for something that you want, desire, bless someone else's wish. Bless the planet Earth with their wishes being fulfilled, which will then what? Karmically entitle you to have your wish fulfilled. Never forget that. It is in the giving that we receive. Too many people ask, 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 but don't give first. Remember we talked about this of the karmic bank account? You have to deposit before you can withdraw. As a farmer, you have to plant before you can reap. So you have to give, you have to exhale before you inhale. So Om Mani Padme Hum is a very good mantra for that, for wish fulfilling. Next question, what is the purpose of the great invocation? That's a big one. Okay, so the great invocation is an ancient, 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 super ancient, super duper. If I told you how ancient it 
is, you wouldn't believe me. So I'm not gonna actually share that because uh, I was instructed not to. It's ancient. And when I say ancient, I mean more than you think ancient. When we think ancient, we're like 5,000 years. That's pretty ancient. No, I'm talking way more ancient. So the great invocation is simply the practice of blessing the earth with light, love, and power and anchoring that energy into the planet. What are the energies of the soul? Light, love, and power. Light, love, and power. So any, this is a thing you want to write down. Holy Master DK, who is connected to the great invocation, said that all disease comes from lack of soul energy. What soul energy? Light, love, and power. So any disease in your finances is a lack or a distorted proportion of light, love, and power in your finances, in your physical body, in your emotional body, in your mental body, in your causal or spiritual body. Any form of disease on any of those bodies in any and all areas of your life is lack or a distortion of light, love, and power. So the great invocation is seeking to give the earth the energies it needs in the ratio that it needs it in. So historically, for over 25 years within pranic healing, every full moon meditation ends with the great invocation meditation, which was brought initially in the 1940s through the Alice Bailey organization, Lucius Trust, where there are great, great teachings, priceless teachings within that school. And so they teach the great invocation and it's been slightly modified in pranic healing or hatha yoga for our specific purposes and the way we understand energy. Okay. There are many levels of truth to the great invocation. Currently, there's only maybe the second, a second level of truth is being revealed about the great invocation in general, but there are many, many levels of the great invocation. So the purpose is to impregnate light, love, and power into the planet. And the um, Lucius Trust, has a program of you teaming up with two other people and doing the great invocation. I believe it's one time, if I'm not mistaken, um, every single day. So you find two buddies through the organization. They could be in Australia, right? Australia, um, I don't know why I can't think of another place on the planet, Nicaragua and Denver, right? You find three people and then you all do the great invocation together takes you five, 10 minutes out of your day, and that's part of your world service. Um, as a spiritual person, it's part of your, your responsibility to do the great invocation at least once a day. Okay. Um, I was lucky enough many years ago to have a consecrated great invocation poster directly from Master Choa which needless to say, there were some quite intense experiences. There are meditations you can do with the Great Invocation poster. All the posters, hint, hint, and pranic healing are portals. Next question. I've wanted a car for the longest time, but can't seem to materialize it. What should I do? Save the money, make the down payment, and drive it off the lot. So basically the person is asking about how to materialize something. So we talked about this before. This goes to the principles in Kriya Shakti, which is taught by Grandmaster Cholo Puksui and the Masters of Pranic Healing. It's a two-day class, 16 hours. In, in that 16 hours, you're taught the five principles on how to take an idea and materialize it, how to take a thought and materialize it. And it could be materialization on the mental plane, you want to develop your mental body, so there's ways to materialize that. You want to develop something on the emotional plane. You want to feel better, so there's ways of materializing that, right? There's something you want uh, physical healing on, physical assistance. There's ways to materialize that. 
And then things that you want externally. I want a new car. I want a new house. I want a new partner. I want a new whatever, right? And that those five principles teach you the process of materialization. But in general, the one we talk about is the principle of abundance, which means you tithe every single month for the rest of your life, 10% net to a spiritual organization of your choice. That's the simplified version without getting into the deeper teachings. 10% net income per month, spiritual organization of your choice. Number three, service to an organization that you believe in three hours per week or more. Three hours per week or more. So it could be Habitat for Humanity, helping people build their houses. It could be a domestic abuse center, which I've done work in New York on. It could be a soup kitchen, a feeding program. It could be healing people. It could be teaching people through your expertise, right? It, it's serving people who cannot pay you back. Giving to others who cannot pay you back. And then learning the lesson, also practicing yana yoga, which I can't get into the finer points of it, but learning the lesson is I want to materialize a car. I want to materialize a new house. I want to materialize a whatever. Okay. What's the, what are the factors as to why it's not materializing? Is it that you're constantly saying, I can't materialize it, I can't materialize it, I can't materialize it. That's one thing you need to stop doing, right? So you go, okay, I can materialize this. What do I need to do? And then that's following industriousness. Then you do it. Oh, I have my five things I need to do to get a car. I'm going to do it. And then you materialize a car. So tithing, service learning the lesson and understanding what to do and then doing it. And that goes with not just cars, but that goes with anything in life. Next question. What actually is character building? This topic gets me jacked up all the time. I can talk about it for hours. So character building is the virtues that Grandmaster Cho Kuk Sui talks about. Whoops, did I lose everyone? Nope, I didn't. There we go. Character building are the virtues that everyone talked about or Master Cho talks about within chronic healing. The virtues are, there's five virtues with an additional six one. We don't say the sixth virtue, haven't quite figured out why not. Maybe because it's general, right? Um, so the virtues are loving kindness, not injury generosity and non-stealing, accurate perception, correct expression with the sub-virtue of honesty and non-lying, moderation and non-excessiveness, and constancy of aim and effort and non-laziness. And then the sixth one is the golden rule, the yang golden rule and the yin golden rule. The yang is do unto others as you would want them to do unto you. The yin golden rule is do not do unto others as you would not want them to do unto you. So it's the law of karma, which is taught in all major, 13 major religions and spiritual practices. So basically, if you are living a virtuous life, you're living by the virtues, or you're living by the character, you're, you're do, living character building. So if you're living a virtuous life, your life will dramatically improve and your suffering will dramatically go down. If you are not living by the virtues and you're living by vices, your life will dramatically get worse and continue to only get worse. So you're digging a deeper and deeper hole. So if you ever have a question of what you should or should not do, consult the virtues. Look at the virtues. Okay, I'm looking to do X. Is it a loving and kind thing to do for myself and others? Yes. Does it cause injury to others and myself? No. Okay. So that's a, I'm in alignment with the virtue. So I'm protected. I'm taken care of. I'm doing the right thing, right? It may not be easy. It may not be comfortable. But if you look at the virtue, I'm in alignment with the virtue. Because where are the virtues come from? The higher soul. Light, love, and power. What's light? Accurate perception, correct expression. What's love? Loving kindness, non-injury, and generosity, not stealing. What's power? Constancy of aim and effort and non-laziness. What's moderation and non-excessiveness? Balancing the three aspects of light, love, and power. 
Sometimes you need to be more powerful than loving. Sometimes you need to be more loving than powerful. So character building is super, super important. It is the foundation for your personal life, your business life, and your spiritual life. If you do not practice the virtues, you will fall. Believe I'm going to say, if you do not practice the virtues, you will fall. The most important thing. The most important thing is being a virtuous person. So that's what character building is. So when we say in pranic healing in our hatha yoga, are you practicing character building? It means are you systematically practicing the virtues, right? Benjamin Franklin, in his book, Poor Richard's Almanac, goes through 13 different virtues to practice systematically throughout the year and throughout the rest of your life on how to become a better person. And funny enough, Benjamin Franklin was a very advanced soul. Yeah, but I heard he had girlfriends outside of his wife. Okay. All right. So that means what? Does that negate his virtue? Maybe he was weak in a certain area of his life, but very developed in many other areas of his life. So let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? That's where discernment has to come into play. So for instance, there is a spiritual teacher, I'm not going to name names, that was um, in trouble for many sexual allegations and misconduct, but to leave the United States and kind of be exiled permanently, because if this person came back to the United States, there would be millions of dollars of fines and legal fees that would have to take place. So he chose to leave the country and not come back. This person is still teaching yoga, still holding retreats. Now, does this mean that this person is, because of sexual allegations that may or may not be true, does this person, does it mean that this person is 100% bad and a poison? No, it means that there are several major character flaws within this person that are materializing in this way. But there are other virtues that have been developed over a period of time that the discerning disciple can what? Extract those virtues and go, aha, if I want to be prosperous and successful in my endeavors, I have to embody what? Industriousness. This person was industrious. Okay, this person had vices around sex and around deception and around wasting money. Okay, I don't want those vices or I don't want the fruit of those vices. So I'm not going to practice those vices. So do you see how for the discerning disciple, no matter what, you can extract the good and leave the bad. Rather, or, or the more common thing to do is do what? Judge, 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 judge. So great. You judge the person. What did you get out of it? How did you become a better person through judging another person? You didn't. No awareness, no understanding, nothing to practice, no inner transformation. So as Master would say, even your, even the bad teachers, quote unquote, on your spiritual path, helped you with your development. So those people who were taken advantage by this yoga instructor were neutralizing some negative karma and have an opportunity to do what? Practice awareness, practice discernment, moving forward, practice forgiveness to let go and to heal and to live a greater life. Or they can take that experience, be angry for the rest of their lives, learn nothing, and then die taking that karma to the next incarnation. That's an opportunity as well. Okay, uh, next question. What would you consider the biggest limiting factor in living a great life? Ooh, that's a big one. <laughs> it is a big one because it's the biggest one. Um, one of the biggest, maybe not the biggest, because I, I can't say that for sure, but I can say this with 100% certainty. One of the biggest is low self-esteem. 
Low self-esteem is connected to negative pride. Negative pride is the last thing to leave. So low self-esteem is your, you believe you're superior to everyone or you believe you are inferior to everyone. So low self-esteem prevents you from realizing who and what you truly are. So I would say low self-esteem. I have been studying low self-esteem since 2019. And I see it over and over and over again. Not that I'm looking for it, right? Because if you look for it, you'll find it. But I just, when I hear people, when I listen to people, when I hear people's success stories, I go, what was the factor? What brought them from being unsuccessful to successful? What brought them from the bottom of the barrel to, to back on top, right? What brought them from unfulfilling, unrewarding, unhealthy relationships to finding the love of their life? What, what were the factors? What were the things, the, the ingredients that came together to create the result? And I usually see it. They let go of low self-esteem and they started building good self-esteem. They let go of their negative pride. They started being humble. And, they're, and when you're humble, you're conductive to the energies of the soul. When you're full of negative pride, you're squeezing the pipe of where the energy and blessings are coming from. So, and, and I will say this, the people that are, that I've known for five, 10, 15 plus years that are still stuck, they're stuck because of negative pride, which is connected to low self-esteem. So maybe you could say negative pride, right? Negative pride is like the all-compassing energy. One aspect of negative pride is low self-esteem. So when someone has low self-esteem, they have negative pride. Next question. How many types of Twin Hearts meditations are there and what are their purposes? Uh, good question. There are many Twin Hearts meditations. So the first one that most people are exposed to is planetary peace meditation. The planetary peace meditation, which is 20 minutes long and that has the OM. Then you have the Twin Hearts meditation for self-healing. So when someone's physical or, or etheric bodies need healing, that's about 32 minutes long with the OM. Then you have Twin Hearts for psychological healing. So for people who have mental and emotional disorders, phobias, addictions, suicidal tendencies, poverty consciousness, that's a great meditation for that. It cleanses deeply the emotional and mental bodies. That's about 34 minutes long with the with the with an ohm and it's the gap is longer. The longer the gap in between each ohm and the twin hearts meditation, the more energy is coming down. The deeper you can go and the higher you can go. Um, there's also twin hearts meditation with Om Mani Padme Home. So for generating mercy and compassion and good fortune in your life. There's a three minute twin hearts meditation, which I was joking with uh, uh, a few people in the group back way back when. Um, it's extremely difficult to find, but it's Master Choa leading a three minute twin hearts. Everyone's like, I want to get on, the, give me that one. And I don't have to spend so much time doing the other ones. Right. But it's, it's unbelievably powerful. I think Master really packed a lot of energy in that. Um, but I don't recommend people get into that practice if they're not. If they're not used to meditating regularly, start meditating regularly. And then if you're karmically entitled, you'll, you'll find the three minute twin hearts meditation. Um, very, very powerful. Um, what else? What are their twin hearts? Um, there's a twin hearts for Wesak that we'll be doing. So if you've never heard the Wesak festival twin hearts, you'll be hearing that on April 26, 2021 at nine 34 p.m. Mountain Time, something like that. Um, what else? What else? Um, and then there are Twin Hearts Meditations without the Ohm. So a Twin Hearts Meditation without the Ohm is for the general public, meaning people online that aren't being monitored by a teacher or facilitator. Because when you introduce the Ohm, it increases the effect 
much, much more. And then there are Twin Hearts meditations that are only played at our Hatha Yoga retreats. They're only played at our Hatha Yoga retreats because there's a certain quality of energy that's implanted in the recording that is very potent and it wouldn't be appropriate for not just the general populace, but also for regular Twin Hearts meditators. It's too much energy. I remember to give you an example, we were at a retreat and this might have been the sixth day or seventh day of nine days of this particular retreat. And we had already been doing lots of purification practices, physical exercises, breathing exercises, lots and lots and lots of meditation. So our energy bodies were very, very clean. So one of the masters says, how many of you would like to hear this particular ohm? And we're like, is it going to get us all jacked up and leave our bodies? You're like, I'm on board. Yeah, let's play, let's play it. And played it. And after maybe maybe three minutes out of my body, completely blissed out, and then came back feeling overwhelmed, not nauseous, but overwhelmed just by listening to an ohm. And it was not just me, but everyone else in the group. And so the master was smiling and said, do you know what that was? We're like, no, what was it? Like, can we all get a copy of it? Is that that was a level three ohm. So master is connecting to level three arhatic energies and then ohming with a certain intention. So even if you are not um, consciously aware of what's happening, your energy body is getting affected by it. Right. Just like people don't know consciously what's happening during the full moon. Right. But our energy body is being influenced by the full moon. OK, so I had a friend that would play certain mantras, high level mantras that he got access to. And it says, do not play while driving. Right. That's the instruction. It's not on the CD, but it's told don't play while driving. And he would be driving, listening to this high level mantra, and he would just get lost go down one-way streets, be all over the place, completely ungrounded. Why? Because the crown is super expanded. So you're like this, you're like a bobblehead. You're all blissed out. You're not in the physical world, right? That's why it says on the Twin Hearts CD, if you purchase the planetary piece or the other CDs, it says, do not operate, do not listen to while operating heavy machinery or driving because you get too blissed out. Yeah. Right? So those are some of the Twin Hearts meditations and their purposes. And last question. Dun, 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 dun. I've heard the quote from Einstein, no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. How does that relate to energy healing or spirituality? Great question. Simple. If you're experiencing something emotionally, right? You're experiencing something emotionally, sadness, depression, fear, what have you. What level of consciousness is that? The emotional body, the emotional plane. So if you wanna solve that problem of sadness, anger, fear, what can you do? Go to the mental plane, and solve it on the mental plane by having right viewpoint about the situation, or you go to the physical plane and you solve it through running, running for your life, or you solve it by exercising and purging out the energy from your system. I know many people that are super, super stressed out, which is where emotional body that exercise after work and what do they feel like? million dollars. So they solve the problem, not at the emotional plane. They solve the problem at a different plane. Master Glenn talked about this many, many years ago. I always thought it was fascinating. I was like, huh, it makes so much sense. It makes so much sense. And so if you're having a mental issue, hello, if you're having a mental issue, if you have a problem you can't solve, what do they recommend that you do? Go for a walk. It changes the energy. And then people miraculously, mysteriously get an answer to their mental problem. 
If you have a physical problem, physical ailment, you can practice understanding and you and or you can practice feeling better about it. And yes, obviously, if you have a cut in your arm, you also want to take care of the arm. But that's partly what it means by no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. So another level of truth is that the version of you 10 years ago didn't have the level of awareness, level of understanding and transformation to give you the kinds of answers that you can give yourself now. So the more you can develop your awareness, the more you can develop your understanding, the faster you can come up with solutions to the problems in your life. But if you stay the same, if you don't have more awareness, if you don't have more understanding, if you don't practice anything, then you'll be stuck with the same problems and dealing with them in the same way five years from now. How many people do you know keep hitting their head and banging their head up against the wall year after year after year, applying the same level of thinking to the problem? Right? That's why it's always good to go to a healer, go to a mentor, go to a coach, go to an advisor, go to a guru who can give you higher viewpoint and or different viewpoint to go, huh, I never thought about it like that. I never looked at it like that. Interesting. But if you are always seeing things at your limited viewpoint, you can't transform. It's a good question. I like that question. Okay. So I hope you got value out of this. I hope you guys have an amazing WESAC. But Christian, are we doing Sunday? Yes, we're doing Sunday. So we're doing Sunday lecture, meditation, and healing for everyone to get ready and prepped up for WESAC the following day on Monday, Monday evening, or Monday evening for most of us. Um, and thank you again for your questions. It helps everyone benefit in the group. It inspires me to keep doing what I'm doing. Um, because it's about adding value to you guys. It's about helping you transform. And anything else? Any other questions, comments, concerns? Nine? Okay, perfect. All right, let us close. Be aware of the heart. Be aware of the crown. Be aware of the heart and the crown together. To the Supreme God, Divine Father, Divine Mother, respect and beloved teacher, Grandmaster Cho Koksui, to his teacher, Lord Bodhisattva Meiling, to Lord Buddha Kuan Yin, to Saraswati, to Holy Master Count Saint Germain, to all the holy gurus, holy masters, saints, archangels, holy angels, to the angels of wisdom, to the angels of awareness, understanding, and inner transformation, to our divine selves, our higher souls, we thank you all for your great, great blessings. Thank you for helping us become better souls, to become greater instruments of goodwill and the will to do good. Thank you for helping us let go of any and all things that we are not, to truly be aware of, understand, and experience who we truly are, the soul. Thank you, thank you, thank you. With gratitude, respect, and love, we thank you in full faith. So be it. Thank you. Whoa. That was intense. Something was happening there. Ooh. That's nice. Anyways, love each and every one of you. Enjoy the rest of your Thursday evening. I look forward to serving you. I'm going to... So I'm posting this one in the group on Facebook and on Thinkific. And then the other two that we recorded yesterday, those will be posted over the next two weeks. Okay. So you have an understanding um, how we're laying that out. All right. So lots of love to each and every one of you, and I will see you soon. Bye-bye.